There's a slight problem with 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 the sweating. Hello, Steven Seagal. I want to help people like me and and change a lot of people. It was that he attacked me first. I was called a liar. Those people aren't informed. To me, it's quite hypocritical. They're calling me a bully. Look what you've done. You're a horrible person. And you weren't an innocent abroad. How could you possibly appear before the Treasury Select Committee and get the assets of the bank out by a margin of over £40 billion? Pounds? I know. I, I have a peculiar medical condition, which is that I don't sweat, um, or I didn't sweat at the time. Um, hello, Sam. Hello. There were lots of people on the telly just now. I know. I was quite shocked. I you like... weren't any of them. <laughs> So just for those people who might not know what it is to be an interview producer and or booker, which is the thing that you have written your fabulous book about. Thank you very much, Lee. What was your job? So basically those moments that you see where some kind of magic fairy brings somebody onto the stage or into the line of the camera or into the studio, and then you enjoy them being basically ruined or not ruined as the case may be, sometimes on Newsnight, it was my job to bring in the kind of high-end ones, so the kind of A-listers, the princes, the movie stars, the Stormy Daniels, the Sean Spicers, the James Comeys, the Netanyahu's, the Justin Trudeau's, that kind of vibe. Did anybody hear any name-dropping at all? <laughs> Just Sam, Sam the, the, that's the sort of weird greatest hits collection we just saw so did you name any of them though yeah I know who some of them were i think i think I, yeah. I think i got most of them but then i have read the book so maybe that's a clue definitely um, helps. i would love i would love to know um and I mean, there's tons i want to understand about it but the the this what is this skill that means is this this whole setup is awkward and weird okay because my job that i have now is a little bit like the job that sam has written this extraordinary book about it's it's almost like i'm the cheeky girls and she's paul mccartney <laughs> songwriting wise so forgive me if i just ask you for loads of tips of how oh, to no be better at my job but but what was the skill that made you the person to land all of those interviews that nobody else could get I'd say the skill is realism, first of all. It's like lots of people who work in the BBC think that they are God's gift to kind of like journalism and to the world. And so the assumption is that if you ring someone up who's extremely important or you ring their second in command or whoever you're speaking to, that they're kind of like, you're doing them a favor. Mm. And I think that was the first misunderstanding about journalism and the way that you should deal with people. If someone's running a country, you're not doing them a favor letting them come on your program. <laughs> so I think the first proposition was that I understood that there's a slightly more complex relationship with guests and the job that we were doing. So I would be honest and open. They're taking a risk. They're taking a palpable risk. And sometimes they're taking an extreme risk in the case of Prince Andrew. But any CEO or leader of a country or politician or someone famous or someone <coughs> plugging a book uh, <laughs> who comes on the program is taking a risk. It's live television and it's quite a vicious program sometimes. So being realistic, I think, is the first start. So you don't approach them with a misunderstanding about the fact that you're important, they're unimportant mm. and that you're doing them a favour. And then persistence. I was really shocked by how many people just like give up straight away. When I started managing people and you would say, have you put that bid in for important person? And they'd be like, yes, yes, I have. I'm like, oh, what happened? Oh, well, the email bounced back. So what did you do next? <laughs> oh, well, the email bounced, bounced back. You know, no, 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 no. What did you? So, so many people give up really quickly. And I think the last thing that actually, so simple, so basic, but being polite, being well-mannered. If you don't get your own way, I would hear in another office quite close to us that shall not be named, but let's just say it's a very prominent Radio 4 program in the mornings. <laughs> I can't tell you which office though, okay? <laughs> but I would hear when they didn't get what they wanted, which was the interview, and they would always get it nine times out of 10. I was the underdog. I was the poo on the shoe, I used to say. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> it's like, we've got 300,000 viewers some days, you know, it's a vicious program. Why would anyone want to come on? Mm. And you would hear them, you hear them screaming, how dare you? I can't believe this. Do you know who we are? Well, you do now because I accidentally let it out. So that, I think, being respectful, polite, knowing your position rather than being full of yourself and being persistent and kind 
got me a lot of content. Kindness is an interesting word to use because um, all throughout the book, and for people, I didn't know this job existed before James made me do it. So um, I, it's a, it is a surprise to me. I'm weirdly validating, actually, that when you talk about it and you talk about how you went about trying to find Paul Flowers, he's the co-op guy, right? right. And, and the way you went about trying to get in contact with him was you start by Googling and looking him up on LinkedIn. And that's what I do. I was like, yes, <laughs> this is the right approach. And then obviously there are other things. But, but there, there, it, there's, I, I feel like there's no magic to it. But, and yet there obviously is because I don't really get Prince Andrew very often. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's going to be doing another interview. No, I'm, I'm so, really, I'm really so right sorry thing. to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was a one-off, guys. I apologise. I've, I've ruined it. There he um, is. Yes, well, lovely we, setup. We, we've never had a member of the royal family on Newsnight and awkward. Uh, I think that will be a one-off member of the royal family on Newsnight experience. I, yeah, I do think kindness really matters, actually. I'm mm. not particularly a trendy thing to say. Perhaps post-COVID, it's mm. uh, more trendy. But that kind of thing where everyone is second in command in the role that I was doing. We're not the editor. We're not the presenter. We're not, you know, running the BBC. So we all have an understanding. Mm. So if I was dealing with somebody whose job was on the line, their neck was on the line. Mm. And we know it. To be frank, if things go right, this is no reflection on the presenters who were fantastic, but they get all the credit. Yeah. If things go wrong, you can bet it's the producer that's going to be having a talking to. So we had that commonality of understanding that if their boss was, for example, the Chinese ambassador who did the first ever interview mm. with us, mm. he'd never done an interview in the UK. I spent hours and hours in the Chinese embassy and all my colleagues in World News were like, how did you get that? I'm like, well, have you been to the embassy and met with his people? No. Well, that's, that's how. But knowing that their jobs were on the line, or sometimes even more profound things than just their jobs, that empathy, that kindness, that understanding of one another makes a world of difference when most people they deal with are dismissive, difficult, hard to work with, and often rude. The theme of this evening, we called it power in the press. We were going to call it spin. And then we thought, actually, it's not its not really that. It's about something else. And all throughout this book, there's this quite, com it's deceptive, actually, because it's a rip rollicking read for starters. Thank you. But there's a, there are sort of layers of interwoven webs of different power structures. There's sort of hierarchy and bureaucracy. There's obviously royalty and fame. There's those things you've just talked about, newsroom dynamics to do with seniority, men and women, you know, all of that stuff is is there to see. Um, and I really want to talk to you about the BBC. Because this was, how long were you there? 18 years? Oh, 18 years, yes. And then you years. and then you and then you left. And what's quite affecting about the book is the way you sort of just in a, maybe seven or eight words, you will say, and then this happened and then and then you move on. And some of the things that are in the eight eight words and then this happened are really brutal things. Mm. I went on maternity leave and I got shoved into a development room after I came back. Mm. I asked for promotion, obviously didn't get it. You know, talk to me a bit about that. I think it's interesting because I'm slightly in that invidious position that lots of you who've left jobs will understand that I don't want to be the bitter ex. <laughs> so the BBC was very good to me. I had some extraordinary experiences. I am an experienced billionaire. I've done some incredible things. <laughs> Doesn't mean there aren't things that could be done better. And, and there, there definitely are. I would say there was a big difference in terms of the hierarchy that you're talking about between hugely gifted and talented correspondents and presenters who are known rather unhelpfully, in my view, as the talent, mm. which makes the rest of us, I don't know, the, the untalent. Uh, unta <laughs> is that a word? I don't know. Untalented. <laughs> and so that, I think, is, is unhelpful in, in that world. So there is, I think, probably a twin treatment that if you're at the top, you know, it's a different experience from if you are one of the many hundreds of journalists who work there every day, are proud of their job and what they do. But there is, I think, a bit of an assumption of, you know, you're, you're lucky to, to work here, so be quiet. And over a period of years, that can get a little bit wearing, let's put it that way. You talk about, you specifically mentioned Kellyanne Conway as one of the ones that got away. Who is the person that you would book now? Who's the one you'd really want to get now? 
Well, the one that would be most pertinent right now would obviously be Putin, but the one I would most like to book. Would you Would you try and get Putin? Would of you course. try and book him? Would you? Of course I would. Can you get him on LinkedIn? How'd you find him? <laughs> There's always start. a way. Don't give him There's any ideas. When I, start, when I started doing this job, I didn't have any connections or contacts. You know, my mum and dad, they left school at 14. You know, I was kind of like working class, made good. I became a lawyer. I didn't know one. I've written a book. I've never even written anything other than a legal article. You know, so I didn't have any connections. So I started from nothing. And my ambition was to be no more initially than six degrees of separation from people. But over the years, I'd say I probably got that down to two degrees. Hmm. So I reckon if I wanted to bid for Putin, I know somebody who knows someone who works for him or I don't know, who knows him very well, who knows something like that. I'd, I'd, I'd find a way. Um, but the one that got away from me while I was at Newsnight was Sir Philip Green. Hmm. I was so close. Uh, but I wasn't allowed to go and meet him in person for understandable restrictions about the use of your very, very important license fee payers' money. But I was invited to meet him face to face. Uh, and I think if I had, I would have closed it. And that would have meant that instead of it being a Robert Peston interview, it would have been a, an Emily Maitlis interview. And that would have been very, very good television. It would have been very good television. I feel gutted now and for all of really us, that, that didn't happen. Um, Devastated. I'm, st I'm, I'm getting over it, it's, you know, four years later. Dennis Rodman, 10 years ago, still not over it. But it's going to be OK. I'll get over it eventually. What happened with Dennis Rodman? Oh, don't. I can't even go there. So there is something I would say is like a, a thing in news. And those of you who've worked there will know where it's just kind of like what I would call a no brainer. It's just like there's just no conversation, surely. So. I had Dennis Rodman, who's obviously the elite athlete, for those of you who don't know, African-American athlete, who'd just come back from North Korea. Oh, that's right. Right? Yes. Where he was new best mates, so random, with the great leader. Mm -hmm. I had access to him, the first interview since he'd left, in, get this, Vatican City, because he was having, <laughs> sure. right? I'm not even yeah. making this up. I sound like I'm drunk. In Vatican City, where he was meeting the Pope, <laughs> And I had access to exclusive pictures, which I can show you later. Oh, amazing. <laughs> which may or may not have involved Dennis, the great leader, and a hot tub. I'm just saying. <laughs> this is the biggest no-brainer in news history. My editor wouldn't run it. Why? She said it was, you know, that the Newsnight audience wouldn't enjoy it. I said the Newsnight audience would enjoy it. He's going to say some outrageous things. It's going to be one of those moments everyone's talking about for weeks. If they don't know who he is, we can explain. They certainly know who, you know, Kim Jong-un is, and they certainly know who the Pope is. So I think we're going to be all right. It's just six minutes of telly, and it's free, a word I like. Yeah. Still, I wouldn't, wouldn't run, it. run it. I stropped. It's the only time I've walked out. Um. So the, the, you touched on something quite interesting there. So the news site audience wouldn't enjoy it. And there's an element of there's a, that's that's a tabloid play in many right. ways that that set up. But there, we saw some clips from some interviews that really were not tabloid start in style, serious, hard, heart wrenching. But there's always a sort of flavour. So I wonder how you would walk that line of what is news really and what is just salacious entertainment. I mean, I know it's still news night. But yeah, that's quite a fine line. And I think that comes from quite a personal position. So obviously, I love, uh, you know, as I say in the book, I love something that would have been on the front page of the mail. Yeah. But instead, it's a news night. So the mail were dying for Paul Flowers. For those of you who don't remember, he was the disgraced uh, chairman of the co-op. He'd resided over a period there that had been, let's say, somewhat tricky mm. uh, in terms of its finances. And he was also known as the Crystal Methodist because of his penchant, allegedly, for that particular drug. And he also had an alleged penchant for rent boys. So, perfect mix. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a dream come true. Sure. I mean, the mail did six pages criticising it. It was like my best day ever. I was like, until Andrew, that was the most I'd ever had. Criticising the interview? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. I was like, yes. Um, but that, you know, that was something which I knew I could get over the line because... He'd been the chair of the co-op. You know, he'd been in front of a select committee. There had been allegations against him that were financial. So it had the highbrow element that I knew I needed to tap into yeah. to get the lowbrow element that I knew the viewers would also enjoy. Yeah. Asking him what it was like as a Methodist minister to have presided over something that was, by his own standards, immoral, inappropriate and illegal. And I like that mix. Mm. And I think viewers like that mix. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with being entertained. 
<laughs> and I wanted to try and provide intellectual entertainment. And at its best, that's what Newsnight is. It's a bit of both. Yeah, interesting. Um, let's talk about Mel Gregg. Yes. People in the room remember who Mel Gregg is or was, still is. She still mm. is Mel Gregg. So, so it, that's interesting that, that her name hasn't sort of rung a bell because yeah, I didn't instantly recognise it. They'll remember the story. So go on. T- so, so who is Mel Gregg? So do you guys remember, though, when there was a time that it's now, is she now the Princess of Wales? And Catherine yes. was pregnant. Yeah. She was very sick. She was in hospital and a prank happened. And the prank would have been a harmless, brilliant prank where some Australian DJs called the hospital and they were put through. And the people that were worked with her, the they were to be the Queen yeah. and Philip, I think. Yeah. Or Charles, can't remember. I think it was Philip. They got put through, Lord above, best prank ever so far. Mm. They only realised the staff when they started making some inappropriate comments about corgis, uh, that they weren't the real people. But then something terrible happened, which was that the poor nurse who had put the call through, um, a woman called Jacintha Saldana, three days later she took her own life. Yeah. Yeah. So something that three days earlier had been something we all thought was clever and brilliant and hilarious became a terrible terrible tragic tale mm. and Mel was the epitome of sort of the the broken blonde you know she's sort of certain age so attractive you know and she was on the front page of every single publication um there was a male co-star with her who pretended to be Philip but he didn't really get the same attention and her life overnight changed completely fundamentally And she was vilified, death threats. Her mother was threatened. She lost her job. She walked away. She became a pariah. And he won, I think, DJ of the Year the next year, and he didn't lose his job. Mm. So quite a different experience. Yeah. But she was, um, you know, extraordinarily affected by what had happened. And I tried for two years to persuade her to come on the programme. So I knew her quite well by the time she came on. So what's the responsibility judgment there then? For two years, you wanted to come on the programme. And, and she, she's having this uh, horrendous time, vilified and all the rest of it. She's trying to piece her life back together, think about what she's going to do. Why, why do you want her on Newsnight? And what, how does that all play in your mind? Because there was basically an inquest and the issue about accountability mm. was still being played out in the UK press. Right. So my line would be with making decisions about keeping in touch with people and I would try to be respectful and not hound them in yeah. a sort of, you know, in a it's hard to judge from when to line. Yeah. There's a very fine line between, you know, sort of inappropriate mm. and appropriate. Mm. And particularly when I was dealing with the palace, I think that that line was really fundamental to my success. Sometimes I got it wrong. With Mel, it was still in the press and she came over specifically to go to the inquest. Mm. So at that stage, it was front page news in every paper in the country, even the, the tab, you know, it was the tabs and the broadsheets. Mm. So at that stage, I think the whole country was talking about it. She hadn't given a UK interview. So it was a prize. You know, there is an element of it, which is a news prize, Mm. and you're competing for a news prize. But it was also a human story that the UK public had not heard for you to draw your own inferences Mm. about her accountability or her behaviour. And bringing that story to the public was what I really enjoyed, giving you the opportunity to draw your own conclusions about something you might have read about for two years. How did she feel after the interview? She was good. She was good. I mean, part of my job is basically kind of like, you know, care. So the relationship with the producer is entirely different. Rightly so. The presenter comes in, does his or her job, keeps a distance and leaves. Eight minutes, I think, Evan spent with her, you know, maybe 10. And then that was that. It was Evan Davis at the time. I've been speaking to her person on and off for two years because she was being chased by the paparazzi. The decision was made by my editor at the time that I would spend the day with her Mm. in a hotel Mm. to make sure that I kept anybody at bay. They were pretty sure I could. (laughs) Good judgment call. So I spent about eight hours with her before that 15 minutes that our audience ended up seeing. And that's what's so interesting about the job. It's, you know, the privilege of the human interaction where you get a lot of other information and extra things that never, ever make it to air. And that's the thing I enjoyed the most. What went wrong with Amy Schumer? Is she just really boring? I'm sure Amy is going to send someone after me at some stage. (laughs) I I think 
there's a trend in there news. Is. There is. Look at her. She, she's coming for me. I think she might be. She's still angry about it. She did an interview the other day where she slagged us off. She said, uh, I, well, I don't blame her, obviously. And I've now done a book which isn't going to help. The thing was, there was, and, you know, a line that was crossed in terms of celebrity and news. Mm. For me, the two worlds were quite separate for a number of years. And then it became very trendy to get a celebrity to come on and say, oh, hello, Kim Kardashian. What's your position on, you know, the geopolitics of Syria? Mm. And that became a thing, right? You, you guys are familiar with it. And that sells copy and it made news. For me, it was quite a complex relationship because my audience deserves to receive a certain level of content and the celebrity deserves a certain level of understanding about what they're talking about. Mm. I don't like it when they're just put in a position of being made to look stupid. And I also don't like it when my audience gets an interview with someone where they feel it was a puff piece or we you know, sucked up to them and they didn't learn anything newsworthy. <laughs> so Amy was on that line between the two. My editor at the time had said, it was his number one thing he wanted in the world was an interview with Amy Schumer. So I put aside my beliefs and I just went for it. Sure. I, I delivered it. it, but it didn't quite work. And the reason was because she had things to say about things like, I mean, poor Emily, it was her birthday. It was Emily's birthday. She came in on her Emily day Maitlis. off. Emily Maitlis. Yeah. She did the interview on her birthday and she had to ask Amy Schumer about awkward sex and masturbation. Sure. It wasn't the best birthday present. <laughs> and then we had to ask her about Trump. What is that doing on Newsnight? Sorry to ask. I mean, you know, I'm not the editor. I wasn't the editor. What can I say? I mean, it could have worked, but she, she didn't play game. And she was very uncomfortable. And Emily came in and obviously Emily is so intellectually impressive and just so impressive, full stop. And there was an instant moment like that. And I knew we were in trouble. Mm. <laughs> you know the moment I'm talking about. <laughs> Any women in the room know the moment I'm talking about. And it, I felt the foie d'oeuvre. And I sat there, I would have a pen and paper, old school. Yeah. And because during the interviews, you get a bit distracted and then you go back and you have to edit the thing. And you've got like half an hour and you have to turn it to seven minutes and you've got three hours to do it, so you're in trouble. Mm. So I would write down good answers. And I was sitting there with the pen. <laughs> Answer one. <laughs> Answer two. <laughs> 10 minutes in, I'm like, <laughs> I'm in trouble here. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to lower my standards. Um, and it was just, she hated every second. It was awkward for Emily. Nobody liked the conversation. No one was a winner. No one wanted to be there. And afterwards, Emily's super, super professional. It was her birthday. She was going home. We downed a martini. <laughs> Always a good plan. Always a good plan. Um, we're going to get on to Prince Andrew in a minute because I know people will want to talk about um, him. But I did just want to ask you about Sean Spicer. Mm. So he's the guy with the not such a big crowd after all line. We've all been there. Yeah, sure. Um, and obviously he's, I mean, he's a get, particularly at the time. There he is. Um, but tell me about that setup. Now, who was it that interviewed him? It was Emily again. Emily again. And what were you trying to get out of him? What did you want him to say? Is that, is that the way you go into an interview thinking, oh, I need to get this person to admit X, Y, Z? No, uh, the way I would go into an interview would be, is there something that this person can add to the conversation around news? Because obviously, you know, putting the news in news, like my friend used to say about me. <laughs> um, so here was somebody who had been, you know, whatever you thought of him, somebody who was high up and important in the first days of the Trump administration. Yeah. We thought he didn't last very long, but as it turned out, he was one of the longest lasting ever. Six months? Six months. That's like a thousand Scaramucci's. <laughs> <laughs> he was like amazing. So he had been there at the coalface of all of the things that the whole world was talking about. So that for me was sufficient because we were never going to get Trump. Um, I tried many, many ways and I failed many, many ways. And he did Piers Morgan in the yeah. end. Uh, and that was not going to happen. But Spicer had a seat at the table at the beginning of that administration. And I thought he was fascinating. I had a fight with my deputy editor. He said we should do five minutes. He was a nobody. I'm like, we should do 15 minutes. The audience will love him or hate him. They will get an insight into President Trump. And we've not been able to give our audience any insight into him because all we have is commentators or people who've never actually met him or people who 
hate him or have very strong views on him. But this guy actually worked with him for a long time. So in my view, that's a moment where you might turn on the television and go, oh, Sean Spicer, and, you know, what a loser. I don't want to hear from him. But you're probably going to watch to learn something about somebody that you haven't, maybe, maybe you have been in a room with because he had direct understanding of him. And that interview was great because Emily roasted him <laughs> and he pushed back. And it was a great meeting of Emily's kind of like brilliant interviewing, but his refusal to be cowed by her mm. and to play the game. Mm. And it was, a, I think, an electric 15 minutes yeah. of television. Never got my 15 minutes in the end. <laughs> um, what do you do? Because I'm sure it happened a lot. Um, and actually, it comes out in the Prince Andrew story. So, Because Prince Andrew came to you through his people initially, right? That's right. The weirdest thing ever. Um, is that him? No. Oh, my <laughs> God. My Sorry again, Andrew. I do apologise. <laughs> uh, so initially, because I have loads of emails every day, just like hundreds of them, and you just have to filter through. Initially, I was asked uh, by somebody I'd done a previous job with, who I'd been nice to, uh, as per our earlier conversation, <coughs> to do a puff piece, as we would call it, which is journalism speak for like a free piece of marketing, where they come on. You've seen these interviews, right? They come on and they just talk about themselves or their pet project. This is my charity work. Exactly. Yeah. Let me talk about how amazing I am. Anyway, enough about how anything else. Let me tell you more about how I'm amazing. So he wanted to do that with his pitch at the palace, entrepreneurial concern at the time. Yeah. I declined on the spot. I sent back an email saying, you know, I spoke to them saying, we do news interviews. So I'm really sorry. As much as I'd love to give you 10 minutes of free advertising on Newsnight, that's not available. So do get back to me if at some stage he'd like to do a wide ranging interview that incorporates all of the news elements that Newsnight would ask about, you know, free press, all that jazz. So usually you never, ever hear back from them again. I mean, that's it, right? The end. As luck would have it, a few months later, I heard back from the very nice woman who actually messaged me on LinkedIn to say that she didn't hate me. So that was really good. <laughs> she asked me out for lunch, thank God, because I haven't named her because it's, you know, it's, it's private. It's her business. And would I like to come in to Buckingham Palace on Monday? Uh, is the Pope Catholic? And would I like to meet with his chief of staff, uh, and that Amanda Thursk? That was the first time I'd heard her name. Was I available to come in? Uh, to Buckingham Palace for a couple of hours to meet with her. Wow. What can you say? Yes, I was available. <laughs> I didn't actually tell my editor because we'd never had an interview with any member of the royal family. We had no connections in that field. There is a certain dynamic from what I can tell now down the line of sort of deference and yeah. respect. And people have been quite shocked by how I even got in the palace as nobody knew who I was and we had no relationship with them. So I ended up traipsing along to the palace on my own, having not told my boss on a Monday when I think I was off work, actually, because I work part time. And uh, for a jape, I thought it was just going to be a bit of a lark because even at that stage in May of 2019, before everything went completely terrible for him, why on earth would you take the risk of coming on Newsnight with Emily Maitlis as a member of the royal family even before your friend or non-friend, as the case may be, Mr. Epstein has been incarcerated and died, even before the huge litigation, even before the world went mad for him, why on earth even at that What's your you best guess at an answer to that question at that point in May 2019? Why? I think he wanted to spread his wings in terms of his profile. I think he felt like the forgotten royal. He definitely royal. did that in the end. He yeah. definitely... <laughs> You know, in a parallel universe, the interview went well, uh, but I don't know where that parallel universe is. <laughs> but I think he just wanted to go, you know, it was Meghan and Harry, you know, everything yeah. was there. He was kind it was of a sort of I'm here to kind of play. I felt it was an I'm here to play. Got it. I felt it was an I'm here to play. So at that meeting, I got everything on the table that I needed to. Do you remember Brexit? Yeah. Prince Andrew was going to talk about Brexit. <laughs> Is he allowed to talk about Brexit? No, he isn't, but yeah. didn't seem to bother them. Um, he was going to talk about Meghan and Harry, right, about sure. race and divorce yeah. and modern royal family. He was going to talk about baby Archie. He yeah. was a thing at the time. Would have been good. Yeah, it would have been great. Um, so I thought, oh, great. I get to that stage where I'm like, I've, I've sold this. I'm going to go back and the editor's going to love me. Emily's going to love me. It's going to be great. And then... There's a red line, she yeah. goes. Yeah. And I'm like, we don't do red lines. Mm. I'm like, what is it? 
She said, oh, you can't ask about Epstein. It's an old story. Nobody cares. And at that stage, I have to be honest, we would have asked, of course, but it wasn't. It, he was kind of a forgotten thing until he was arrested and, and all of the litigation started. So I went back. I did a pretentious speech about freedom of speech and freedom of the press and all that jazz that I can bring out now and again. And I hope she'd change her mind. But she didn't. And so we declined. So that relationship of trust, in fact, our, if you like, integrity in declining and the two or three hours I'd spent with her forming a, you know, a very good bond of respect and mutual understanding. It's a long time with someone you've not met before, mm. was the foundation of what happened further down the line. Was that thing, because I'm sure people would try and introduce red lines all the time, you know, or we'll talk about everything apart from not the affair, or we'll talk about everything apart from not that time I crashed the car and I was drunk, whatever it is. 100%. Is, was, is that thing the only thing that would make you decline and walk away? Or are there other things that would put the kibosh on otherwise good interviews? I think that often the thing that the interview would be worried about would be something that Newsnight wouldn't be interested in. So obviously there's a lot of interest in salaciousness or yeah. private lives. Yeah. And if it's material to your job, if you're running a country and there's an allegation that, against you that's like relevant to your job, mm -hmm. then we wouldn't want to ask about that. But if you're a celebrity and you happen to be dating, you know, Kim Kardashian or Kanye West, whoever it is you're dating, we don't give a toot. Mm. So often the thing they were worried about would be something that didn't have news value and yeah. our audience didn't care about. Yeah. But if it was something that crossed the line in terms of that boundary of sort of integrity and freedom of the press and all those pretentious but hugely important fundamental things, mm. then it's a no from us. That's not, not the case everywhere. But um, unfortunately, I think it is diminishing in terms of red lines being rejected. Sometimes it's a merry dance, you know, it's a book and yeah. Sheryl Sandberg and she wants to talk about grief for six minutes and then you get six minutes to ask about Just is Facebook work. destroying the universe? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a merry dance. Yeah. You know, sometimes there is a compromise position. Yeah. But if it's a red line, it's all over. And Sam, let's stick with Prince Andrew and let's talk about this, the second meeting, the one in which there was a surprise guest. That's actually the third the meeting. The third meeting. Okay, let's go third. to the third meeting. Yes. So the third meeting, um, Emily... You're getting close now. This is a sort of, almost like a planning meeting a bit. It was really weird. There was a point in which after the second meeting where I took Emily, yeah. I, I'd never negotiated with anyone with me before. I'd negotiated alone for a decade. And that was really, really good for my type of personality. <laughs> because I do say some tricky things sometimes. I take risks. So doing it with Emily was very good because I brought myself down a level or two by the time we met him face to face. And we met him face to face on the Monday. I'm going to sound like a Craig David song. I don't mean to be glib. <laughs> Final... We're trying to get him at the moment, actually, Craig David. Oh, really? You know yeah. I'll do what I can for you <laughs> with this. If you're out there, Craig, like we all love you. You're amazing. And <laughs> um, we did the final negotiation on Monday. They said yes on Tuesday. <laughs> We didn't sleep all day Wednesday. <laughs> we recorded it on Thursday. We didn't sleep again on Friday. And you watched it on Saturday. So the Monday, uh, we went, myself, Emily, Stuart McLean, who's now editor of Newsnight, who was yep. deputy editor at the time. Yep. We all traipsed to Buckingham Palace. We knew that it was a possibility because at that second negotiation, Amanda had said they were going to do one interview. Mm -hmm. And once she said that, guys, I mean, like, I'm not actually naturally that competitive a person. <laughs> but once she said that, I mean, I, I didn't sleep since. I mean, that was, I was obsessed. You know, I knew what this was and I knew what we could bring to you as a program if we got that interview, if it was done right. So we turned up on that Monday and there was a surprise guest. So that was helpful. And, and she was... Princess Beatrice. Yeah. So the, in the room, there's you, Emily. Emily's Stuart. here. You're Prince Andrew. Sorry about that. Hi. <laughs> We've got Beatrice here. Yeah. We've got Amanda Thirsk here. And then up the end of the other table, it was quite a small room. I felt a bit sorry for Stuart. Stuart's kind of like here. Yeah. I'm not meeting his eye because I know I'm going to say things he doesn't approve of. Poor Emily at some stage probably wanted to elbow me because I, you know, sometimes I take risks. But this was, you know, this was all or nothing. We knew that it was likely... As insane as it sounds, I remember ringing Stuart and saying, I think they're going to do something. And he's like, are you sure? I'm like, I know it's insane, but I think they are. It was all or nothing. That two and a half hours with him face to face and with her. And that are you, that's the first time you've met him Correct. at that meeting. And are you sort of doing the 
interview? Like, are you finding out what he's going to talk about in that meeting? No. So the skill I think of what I would do would be to never ask questions. I know that sounds kind of mad because that's the whole point of an interview. But having been a criminal defence barrister and dealing with clients and dealing with evidence, I know that if you make them get it all out, you're going to spook them. So the skill is having a conversation that you let them lead. And the skill is making sure that you don't basically kind of get everything out. Because if you do, as soon as the camera comes on, they're not going to say any of that again. Yeah. So you're trying to keep a fine line of kind of conversation without going, so did yeah. you do it? Yeah. You know, you have to keep a certain level because that's when the cameras come on. That's when that's going to happen. But you did find out about Pizza Express in Woking in that did. meeting. I did. Yeah. It's funny, actually, because basically I rewrote the book. So I've written the book and I hadn't put about the negotiation in. Mm. And how it works for those of you who are lawyers is as soon as it's in the public domain, it's safe to write about. And about three weeks before I had to send the book in, Emily did an interview and she mentioned the negotiation mm. and it had not been in the public domain. So I went back and I was like, thanks, Em. <sighs> I went back and wrote it. But he mentioned it on the Monday. And it's a bit like a briefing call. Usually what happens as a producer... You take a call with somebody really amazing. On the phone, they're 10 out of 10, right? I promise you. They're amazing. They tell you incredible stuff. You tell your presenter they're going to be amazing. They come on the set and they're one. And then everyone's like, you know, were you tripping? <laughs> this was the one time that that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. On the Monday, to our faces, stony-faced, poker faces, he revealed all of what you saw on that interview on the Saturday and more that I can't tell you because otherwise I will be litigated against. But let me just say it was quite something. And in that meeting, all the things that he said that you would make sure he didn't say by the time Emily sat opposite him. Yeah. He said them all. And that what was so astonishing about sitting 15 feet behind him, because I assume between Tuesday and Thursday, he'd be cleaned up. He'd be told to say, I'm sorry, in 100,000 different ways. I regret this in a hundred thousand ways and I feel terrible for the victims yeah. of this perpetrated crime and this is appalling. He didn't manage to do any of that, but he did manage to say all the things that yeah. we assumed would be left in the negotiating room. Yeah. But he said them all. And at the very end of meeting number three, that brilliant detail, tell everybody what he said he was going to do with Beatrice. He was going to go and have a chat with mum. Pop upstairs, have a chat with mum. I suppose you would, just to check it out. Well, I was like, what do you have to talk to your mum for? You know, your brain doesn't connect. And then because of the context of the conversation earlier, we knew that he meant the Queen when he said mum. He didn't mean Sarah Ferguson. So the Queen knew he was going to do it. Well, I infer that she was told that he was doing an interview. Having met Andrew a couple of times, I can kind of imagine that he may have been the kind of person that might have slightly put a bit of a spin on what it was going to be. Yeah, could have done. So I envisage he would have said, don't worry, mum, I'm going to clear everything up. You know, I've met Emily Maitlis, you know, it's going to be fine. I'm going to do an amazing interview and all of this is going to go away, which clearly was his motivation. He thought he would explain himself and he would be able to get his, his private and his public life back. But yes, he said he was going upstairs to have a cup of tea with mum and chat about it. Extraordinary. So once you, so you've gone to the palace then on the Wednesday, Thursday, you said Thursday you recorded it. We recorded it on the Thursday. And you're sit, standing there in the room, sitting or standing behind him. Sitting 15 feet behind, looking at the floor. On the floor. Like I can't believe it. I can't believe it. You get it in the, in the can or whatever the Correct. phrase is. Good work. Thanks. <laughs> and you go back to the BBC. We run out of there, me and the other holding producers. Holding it, thinking, I hope it's worked. We've got the sound and everything. Yes. And, and then is it possible that in between recording it and you all hearing it and it airing, they could pull it? So I have to say, I thought that something called the establishment that I'd heard a lot about at the BBC would basically <laughs> happen in the 48 hours between yeah. when we recorded it and when it didn't make to air. I could not conceive that it would make it. I assumed there would be a call to the director general from somebody important who would like, you know, bring out something that he did when he was 16 that they were going to blackmail him about. I don't know that there was going to be a huge expensive lawyer who was going to turn up and scream at people yeah. or there was going to be a news editor who basically knew that they were going to lose their job. There was going to be something. something. Surely, surely there had to be something to stop that interview going out. But no. To my knowledge, nothing. Once Gosh. it was done, they took it on the chin.
I, they clearly didn't realize how bad it was, let's be clear, because he, he thought he'd done a great job. Uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, nothing happened to my knowledge. And, and I was quite surprised by that. And it's the so. chief of staff's comment at the end when you finished rolling, she said... No, she, it wasn't the chief of staff. It was the equerry. That's right, yeah. So we, we finished the interview. You can imagine it didn't go well. I think we can agree <laughs> objectively. So I have a real impediment that I'm incapable of being insincere. It's been a huge problem with my career as a lawyer and as a journalist. It really has held me back. And I look up from the floor, this lovely woman who'd been so kind to me, his kind of executive assistant, she explained, because I didn't know what an equerry was. And I don't know what to say to her. And she can probably tell it's not often that I don't know what to say to somebody, quite noisy. So I formulated my words very carefully so as not to be insincere. And I said in a slightly high-pitched voice, befitting the situation, as you can imagine, so how do you think it went? <laughs> Fake smile. And she went, wasn't he wonderful? <laughs> and in all sincerity, of course, I replied, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> really quite wonderful. Yes, he was. Extraordinary. And then the most amazing thing was, I looked up and I saw the schism in the room. So my barrister brain was like, man, you have really, I can't say that word, but you're in serious trouble here with the things you've just said. My journalist brain is like, this is the scoop of the decade, if not the century. And then Prince Andrew is standing there looking pleased as punch. Extraordinary. And that schism between the journalists looking like, oh my God, we've got to get out of here because we're probably going to be <laughs> killed and we're going to be taken to the Tower of London and Prince Andrew. I fear we might go together now. I fear we might. I fear we might. That, that schism really tells you everything yeah. that you need to know about the delusion about how well it had gone. Sam, we've got two minutes left. You, you've delivered that, and I think it was the TV scoop of the decade for sure. It was the most extraordinary... Um, experience of watching it I remember it like it was yesterday um and you go back and you're riding high and you surely you must be greeted like an absolute heroine and yet you left not long after what happened oh we can't leave it on bad terms like that can we come on we've got to that would be churlish well let's just say you might imagine after something like that that for example if you ask for a pay rise or you know a, a promotion or to be able to do some magazine interviews or something like that, that you might be allowed to or maybe even to write a book and and if the answer to every single one of those questions is no there's a stage at which my mum taught me that you need to learn to make a decision if people are saying no to reasonable requests or in my view reasonable requests then it's time to go so i left and you wrote this amazing book and it's going to be a feature film it is, isn't that insane? Who should play me is what we've been playing, which is the weirdest I thing I think Jennifer ever. Lawrence, I think, would be good. Love you. You're welcome. <laughs> Who do you want to get, though? I don't know. If, I suppose if I could choose, if I had a magic wand, I want someone that you're kind of like, you know, that you're hoping is kind of like your ally, because my yeah. book is, you're sitting next to me, right? So yeah. someone maybe like Maxine Peake. Excellent. Good choice. Maybe you could, you know, start negotiating, see if she'll do it. Um, it's been completely fascinating. I really recommend it. There's something about you get a real sense of how it feels inside the Newsnight kind of studio and the sense of the kind of cogs turning behind the machine doing its thing. And all of those hidden people that we never see on the telly um, making the whole thing happen. And I feel like I want to say thank you, not just obviously for coming here this evening because it's been fascinating talking to you, but also for doing all those amazing things because otherwise we'd never have got any half of those brilliant things to watch on the telly. So well done to you. Thank you. Treat yourself to a copy of the book from my colleagues in the foyer. Sam McAllister, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you so much.